Welcome to The Supernatural with Laura Maxwell on Eternal Radio. In these programs, we will hear the true supernatural accounts from those who try various spiritualities. You shall tell the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This is part three of our interview with Mark Hunneman. He is an exorcist and author of the book, Seeing Ghosts Through God's Eyes. And in this part three, um, it's all about EVP recordings and the ghost box and so on, and the parallels between them. And we covered that in the last two shows. Mark had a conversation um, with a woman, an interesting conversation, and he wrote about this in one of his articles, basically where, where she was raising some points about these so-called parallels. And really, I'll just go over to Mark now and invite him to share more about that, that conversation with, with the woman. Hi, Mark. Hey, Laura. So good. Yeah, let's jump right in. We um, we spent the last few times talking about the significance of EVPs and gently warning people that this common practice is really much more dangerous than folks realize. Mm -hmm. And it's an issue that the Bible um, directly addresses in Deuteronomy 18, as well as Leviticus 19 uh, and chapter 20 as well. And it's our passion to try to protect people from being um, burned. Um, you may have the best motives and uh, sincerity in the world, but if you are um, transgressing against God's law, even if you don't know it, you're still going to get burned, mm -hmm. particularly when you're dealing with the spirit realm. So here's what's happened. The last couple of weeks, Laura and I have talked about how there's really no qualitative difference between a, an EVP session in which you solicit a, a response from the spirits that may be in the room attempting to communicate with the dead, in other words. There's no real qualitative difference between that and a Ouija board session. And the reason why that's a pretty powerful analogy is because most people who do EVPs will acknowledge that Ouija, Ouija board sessions are dangerous. But Laura and I are trying to point out that, again, there's no real difference. Sure, there's some minor ones, but the main issue is, is, is the same. And that's, that's really what I'm going to address right now, if I may jump right in. Is that okay? Absolutely, you know, jump right in. And, and as you were saying, I, I thought that was excellent, what you mentioned there. Um, because, because basically, when, when we disobey God's laws, not only one are we disobeying God's laws, but two, it does allow the demonic to jump right in there. Satan's quite happy if we do that. Um, and then those demons can affect our lives or our children's lives very badly indeed. So, yep. I totally agree with you. So please jump right into part three. And and I'll I'll be um, elaborating on that point uh, near the end of this. So mm -hmm. um, I appreciate that, Laura. Thank you. Uh, a while back, I wrote a, I wrote a blog, several blogs about this very thing about the parallel between soliciting EVPs and and the, and the Ouija board, and I got a um, sweet note from a woman, and she raised this point. Um, which, which I thought was good and interesting. Um, and this is what she said. Um, she said that we should not draw a parallel between the dangers inherent in Ouija board use and an EVP session because a Ouija board involves the spirit manipulating the hands or the entire body, you know, when you're using the planchette. Mm -hmm. But in an EVP session, there is no such physical manipulation of the body. There's only the request for the spirit 
to either enter or just the request uh, to communicate with the alleged dead. Um, so what the lady was suggesting was that the parallel was invalid. This is an honest, leg legitimate question, and one I think that uh, deserves a uh, an honest, legitimate answer. Mm -hmm. um, it does seem to me that spirits who manipulate a person's hands or body during a Ouija session is an added danger, uh, perhaps not experienced doing an EVP session, at least not in the same way. And I think, it, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, um, Laura, but I think any time a demon actually takes partial or full, full control of even part of a person, there's uh, um, the p potential for added or accelerated damage. I think that's common sense. Absolutely. If that were, yeah, if that were the end of the story, then it would also spell the end of our plea for the need for EVP reform. Because, um, like we said, the backbone of um, investigations are the solicitation of EVPs in one form, fashion, or another. And it's one of the very first things they do after they get the EMF uh, meter out is they start to try to communicate with the dead. Mm -hmm. But this is what I told her, and I'm, I'm telling our audience, is my, my response, is that however you point out that this objection is valid, valid as it is, misses my main point. The primary and most fundamental similarity between EV, EVP collections and Ouija board sessions is that both either request spirits to enter or there's... It's, to put it more simply, both communicate with or attempts to communicate with the deceased. Mm -hmm. That's the main parallel. And this occurs both logically and temporally, that means time, prior to possible, possible hand manip manipulation by a spirit or a demon. And, you know, demons have to first either enter or be present or given the green light because of our sin before they can touch a person's hand or speak into a recorder. So before the, the demons man manipulate the hands, they have to first be present mm -hmm. or given the green light because of our having uh, disobey God, mm -hmm. which I'll go to more detail in a moment. So again, it's kind of common sense, Laura. Even if you believe in ghosts, you still don't know what kind of spirit may enter during an EVP session, just like this, the worry is with um, Ouija boards. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what people are saying all, all the time. When you use a Ouija board, you don't know what, what spirit's going to come through. Well, how do you know what kind of spirit's going to come through um, while you're speaking to the alleged dead? It's exactly. the same. Mm -hmm. It's the same problem. Mm -hmm. So this invitation for the demon to become present and active exposes everyone there to all manner of demonic influence, influence which have nothing to do with hand manipulation. Both EVPs and Ouija boards are oracles of sorts, and there must be an animating spirit present for either to work as an oracle. The primary danger of Ouija board usage is also present with gathering electronic voice phenomena, or EVPs, mm -hmm. by opening doors which were meant to stay closed. Now, now, after the verbal questioning begins, which happens in both, basically saying, is there someone here? Is Joe here? Am I speaking to my grandma? Mm -hmm. These are similar questions asked by the Ouija board, to the Ouija board, or uh, as investigators are going about the house. After the verbal question begins, the investigators and the client are then potentially exposed to what I call a higher octane presence of the demonic. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is that, uh, well, let me say this, hence the parallel between these two stands. The primary danger attending Ouija board use also attends an EVP. session, mm -hmm. which means that we'll do 
will continue to do that's all in our power to lovingly warn our friends in the paranormal community of the serious danger involved in collecting EVPs. And I challenge you to do the same. If what we're saying is true, uh, and this breaks my heart, but if what we're saying is true about EVPs, then immeasurable damage has it's already been done, and the horrific tragedy continues unabated. I remember when I was on one show with uh, Dave Schrader uh, a while back, and he he admitted that the deep, dark secret of the paranormal community was just how many folks, how many investigators are experiencing paranormal activity at home of their mm -hmm. own, that's so sad. And are suffering um, as a consequence, and it, it really, it really is. And that's what's, that's what's driving Laura, Laura and I is not criticalness or no, judgmentalism. No, it's love all. for the people, because mm -hmm. we know that you're trying, folks who are doing this are trying to help people, uh -huh. but this is a direct violation of God's law, and every law of God has a divine I love you attached to it because whenever we sin it's like punching ourselves in the face um, these things were given to us to protect us but let me hurry on here there's no way to be sure but it is possible that every time alleged ghosts are verbally addressed another portal is open or widened I'm not sure yeah. I like to use a portal the word portal anymore, but regardless, mm -hmm. whenever we talk about ghosts or talk to them, the the presence of the demonic is going to be intensified. Why? The one thing I can say with 100% certainty is that every, every verbal EVP session breaks God's holy law. Deuteronomy 18.11 says, do not attempt to speak to the dead. Every law has, as I said, a divine I love you attached to it. Mm -hmm. And it was given by God to protect us from Horem. And so that's something that really needs to be kept in mind. At this point, I just wanted to mm -hmm. throw in something that I had written some notes. And um, in logic, there's something that's known as a syllogism. And for those who may be in logic, I just want you to know that that the Bible is not just true spiritually, it's true to the nature of reality, um, the fabric of reality, if you can put it like that. The Bible is really, really true um, to the way reality is constructed. And um, so I came up with this, 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 this syllogism, and it goes like this. Uh, a, a syllogism has a major premise, a minor premise, and then from that goes a conclusion. And the major premise is this, and that is that uh, attempting communication with the dead is a dreadful sin. The minor premise is that soliciting EVPs is attempting to communicate with the dead. Mm -hmm. The conclusion is, therefore, collecting EVPs is a dreadful sin. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can see that the conclusion follows from the major and minor premises, and I can tell you from one who has studied and taught logic that this syllogism is both uh, not only valid but sound. You know, a syllogism can be valid but not sound, and what I mean by that is, is that it can the 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 conclusion can follow from the premises, but the premises cannot be true in life. And I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. uh, major premise. Someone says, okay, all umpires are blind. Jim is an umpire. Therefore, Jim is blind. Okay, according to the laws of formal logic, that syllogism is valid. Mm -hmm. But it's not sound because the premises are false. Mm -hmm. Okay, not all umpires are blind. However, what the syllogism I've come up with is not only v valid, but it's sound, because mm -hmm. both premises, mm -hmm. attempting communication with the dead is a dreadful sin. That's true. And then the, the next one, an EVP is attempt to communicate with the dead, 
everybody would agree with that. Mm -hmm. And then the conclusion is that um, soliciting EVPs is a dreadful sin. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to point that out just to help you see that it's not just the Bible, but it's also logic yeah. that can be brought in to, to, to show and maybe impress upon maybe one or two people the um, uh, the unassailability of the Bible's logic and reasoning regarding this. Absolutely. There's a lot of ways people dismiss this, you know, Laura. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I agree, and I also feel what you said about each time a person does, you know, start an EVP VP session or does use a Ouija board or does do any type of, of divination or, or necromancy, each time they do that, I know what you mean, it's it's almost as if another portal is opened, another doorway is widened, as it were, and I liken that really to, I guess it's like, for example, say, this might be an extreme example, but I think it just helps me um, describe what I mean. It's like an addiction, each time you, you, you take another um, alcoholic drink or, or whatever it may be, it is strengthening that um, desire for you, it is strengthening that um, fascination or addiction, whatever it is with the paranormal, each time you do it, um, it stands to reason. So it has that human element of, of being drawn to it each time you do something, you will want to repeat it again and again. Yes, that human addictive type element um, the fascination with it, the interest in it. If it's fed, if you keep feeding it, yeah. it will open that door as it will. Also, not forgetting the demonic element, if you keep feeding that particular type of demon, then it will, yes, um, you know, attract you to doing it more and more, and it wants that, of course. So it's right. like, you know, it's like what they say when you're trying to break an addiction or, or when you are. Um, with God breaking an addiction, not only do you obey God in the um, trying to avoid that area, but you also starve the demon, as it were. You don't keep feeding the demon; you you attempt to starve it so that it loses its grip um, in your life. Precisely, yeah, I, I, that that's a great point. And part of um, sometimes people forget, but you know, Laura, how many times have we heard? Paranormal investigators say that they found themselves obsessing over not only collecting EVPs and other forms of evidence, but spending hours upon hours upon hours reviewing it. And I've spoken to people who have said that that they knew that that was not natural. There, that, that was that was part of the uh, dark influence um, oppression. Mm -hmm. You know, you're just starting, like you said, it, it, what made me think of that was the addiction part. Mm -hmm. You know, obsessing is, is, is a, I guess, another form of addiction, uh, in a sense. Is, um, a lot of people are caught up in that. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a hard cycle to break, and, it, mm -hmm. and frankly, it makes it more difficult for folks to listen to our arguments with a open, clear mind, because we know with addicts, unless they are at a point where they're ready to hear, mm -hmm. say, like, hit rock bottom, they're not going to listen. Mm -hmm. And so I just hope and pray that uh, people will see the, the, uh, the love, the concern, and most of all, God's love and concern uh, that the solicitation of EVPs, just because a very famous person you know or people you know do it doesn't make it right. A lot of people, um, uh, their reasoning goes, well, so-and-so who's very well known solicits EVP and he's a Christian. Well, for a Christian, our first line of defending what we do is not whether someone we admire does it, it's whether or not the Bible allows it. Mm -hmm. And clearly, the Bible, in the strongest terms, forbids us um, to attempt any communication with the dead. 
Let me go on here, if I may. Can I just Have interrupt you... it as yeah. well, Mark, and say I totally agree. And, you know, I think sometimes folks do say, well, it, it's so popular across the world. Society everywhere accepts it. So it must be OK. But I think, you know, what people are forgetting is, in actual fact, when you look down through the whole course of history, often there has been widespread um, things that have been accepted by the entire culture that has been really dangerous or, or whatever, and yet accepted. And then when, when society changes their opinion on it, they will drop that thing, maybe even make it illegal, and the whole of society rejects that particular thing. So just going by the culture isn't a good measure mm. because cultural ideas and opinions can really change depending on what century you happen to be living That's in. That's true. They can change radically. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and something that I thought of uh, when I was writing my book, I think um, this thought came to me, and um, I'm no expert as a historian, but you know what is the peculiar, unique um, situation that we're in now regarding this is I think this is the first time ever in human history that um, well, let me back up for a second. In previous centuries, um, no matter how different the cultures were, um, there almost always was um, a recognition of the difference between the sacred and the secular, um, between the spirit realm and the physical realm. Mm -hmm. And at most cultures, no matter how primitive, they recognized the danger of the spirit realm and so hence you would have things like shamans, medicine men, uh, and so forth, and their, their equivalent in the different cultures, whether it be the Far East, the Middle East, um, Northern Europe, Southern Europe, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so you would have your priests, you'd have your rabbis, etc., and they would be the, the communities, um, I guess, go-between um, not not in a Jesus-like way, but um, just um, a go between as far as the spiritual community and um, attempting communication with with the spirit realm. Mm -hmm. But what I have found is that, to to my mind, and I may be wrong here, but I think ours is the first generation to rush headlong into the spirit realm without the community spiritual leader leading us. Mm -hmm. We have all these people from eight-year-olds to teenagers to 20-somethings to all the way up to, you know, my age in the 60s. This, as far as I know, Lord, this is the first time in human history that en masse you have people disregarding this 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 long-held notion since the dawn of time of the, of the fearfulness of the spirit realm and, and relying upon the community's spiritual leader to lead them there. We have put that aside and people are just rushing into the spirit realm willy-nilly. Mm -hmm. I find that really curious and, and frightening. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I totally, and and I think it that is true uh, because even different in different realms of society, you know, all different areas of society. For example, just one example within, you know, the medical professions. I remember back when I was younger, and into the new age and and, and talking to spirits and all that. I remember that um, the the average doctor, the average medic, they very much. Um, really scoffed at anything spiritual and they mocked it so I remember going to my doctor and talking about acupuncture or, or whatever because I was trying to um, enlighten my doctor um, yeah. and, and you know the doctors then they would say you know there's no real proof that anything spiritual does actually help us physically so they really mocked it now it's the opposite it's as if when, if you go to your doctor for um, some reason uh, say you can't sleep or whatever, one of the first things they will suggest is, for example, uh, meditation, yoga, mindfulness, uh, you know, so it's like the, the boundaries 
um, have definitely blurred, I would say, and there is that much yeah. more of a mixing between the secular and the spiritual. Um, yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, in addition, yeah, to what you said um, and how it's even applied, well, really across the board. Mm -hmm. But what people have done is that they have bypassed the, the community spiritual leader and that has uh, really accentuated the seriousness of the problem uh, because at least before there was some layer mm -hmm. of protection, mm -hmm. which brings me to this. Have you all ever heard of a notion called common grace? It's a term theologians use to describe the blessings that God showers upon believers and non-believers. An example would be rain. Okay, and this common grace also extends to spiritual laws that God has established to protect us. In a very real sense, we don't break natural laws like gravity, but rather they break us. If you try to defy gravity by jumping off a 10-story building, um, you're not going to break the rule of gravity. Gravity will crush you. In, in a similar way, our Lord created spiritual laws which operate in the paranormal or the supernatural realm. The text in Deuteronomy 18.11, which forbids, in the strongest terms, attempting to contact the dead, is an example of God's protective supernatural laws. If we attempt to speak to alleged ghosts, then we do so at our own peril. Between what we see and what we fear, there are doors. And when they are open, nightmares become a reality. Mm -hmm. We are crushed or broken every time we break that law. Every time we attempt communication with the dead, it's like punching ourselves in the face. Where there was once a red light, this is when, what I'm talking about when it comes to common grace, where there was once a red light for accelerated demonic activity because of common grace, but with the withdrawal of common grace due to sin, now there is a green light created for demonic activity, inviting demons to enter and or to intensify and becoming targets of their assault. We may get to walk away, or I don't know if we do, mm -hmm. but our clients, folks that you're helping, are left with the ongoing carnage caused by our breaking of God's objective law, which is both transcultural, which means it transcends all different cultures, and transgenerational, that means for all time. Mm -hmm. um, this, this objective law in Deuteronomy 18.11 is, is authoritative um, for all time. And when Paul speaks in, in 2 Timothy 3 about how all Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for, teachers, for teaching, etc., he was speaking primarily of the Old Testament. Yeah, the New Testament was coming along, but he was had in mind primarily the Old Testament and um, the moral laws of the Old Testament. So, what we're talking about is the withdrawal. Once a person starts, and, you know, this really is a, a um, serious, mm -hmm. serious sin. Mm -hmm. We talked before about how there's gradations of sin. All sins are acts of cosmic treason against God. They're all serious. But the Bible makes it very clear, Lord, that there are... Um, there are gradations of seriousness of sin. Killing a person is worse than having a hateful thought. Mm -hmm. Jesus' point about, you know, having, when you hate somebody, you're murdering them in their heart. People have misunderstood that and say, well, if I hated them, I might as well go ahead and kill them because Jesus said that's not his point. He's not saying that having a hateful thought is, is as bad as murdering someone. He's saying it's murder in the heart. Mm -hmm. So anyway, there, we're told in Deuteronomy that 
this one particular issue, attempting to communicate with the dead, is an abomination to God. And that's an extremely strong word, both in the Hebrew and the Greek. But let me uh, finish up this real quick, if I may. Um, Can I just add to that, Mark, that, you know, I, yep. would, I would agree. You know, someone might say to me, for example, why do you care so much about this issue? There's so many other things people get hurt by in life um, when they disobey God and, and, and follow sins. And I know that, yeah, but I feel it, it's one of the most dangerous simply because it is talking with demons. These are evil, yeah. evil spirits. Yeah. They're pretending to be the dead. They're pretending to be aliens or Palladians or spirit guides or whatever. You're talking to evil demons that are from Satan and really just want to kill you. That's why I feel it is so, um, yeah. so dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like that's... It sounds strange, but there's sins and then are sins. And mm -hmm. the way you put it really clarifies it. When you think of the fact, if you try to picture a demon sitting on your couch mm -hmm. and you having a conversation with it, I mean, it just sounds ludicrous and mm -hmm. horrific. Horrible. But that is precisely, mm -hmm. that is precisely every single time someone who so attempts to solicit an EVP and gets a response, that voice is demonic, mm -hmm. and believe me, they know they know you, and they know how to push your buttons and make make them look attractive, and even sound like deceased Christians uh, mm -hmm. um, or unbelievers trying to listen to the gospel. They are so crafty in trying to persuade you that these things are deceased humans. Mm -hmm. We don't have time to go into the case that, you know, um, the Bible teaches clearly that once people die, they immediately go before God's judgment, thrown in and are sent immediately either to heaven or to hell to uh, await the, um, the final judgment. But um, that brings us back to this point, and that is that... Um, Many investigators have uh, a tag along. Um, someone, a demon, follows them home. Mm -hmm. But what I have, um, I have written two or three blogs recently, which I call "Happy Haunts." In quotes, um, and let me explain. As horrible as the outward oppression is. Um, there's something happening that is much more common and it's, it's more insidious. In a previous uh, time, I had referred to both activities um, as a form of spiritual Russian roulette. Mm -hmm. But the problem with that, Laura, is that that analogy uh, kind of implies that most of the time nothing bad happens. Because in Russian roulette, you know, there's maybe six chambers and one bullet. But I, I don't think it, that... Um, I think that, and well, let me say this. What do you think is more effective, demonic strategy, to visibly attack someone, which gives everybody the alarm bells that something bad is happening, <laughs> yeah, exactly. and leaving no doubt as to what's happening, mm -hmm. or to enter and be a silent but deadly presence mm -hmm. over the span of decades. Mm -hmm. That's what I meant by happy haunt, yeah. is that it looks happy on the outside. There might be little movings of keys and stuff like that, but all along they're acting like spiritual radioactivity, eating your vitals mm -hmm. slowly, turning your heart away from Christ, your children's hearts away from Christ, your spouse's heart away from Christ. What if most Ouija and EVP sessions that don't result in overt demonic attacks do result in this more covert, insidious activity where the person is a target of chronic and acute demonic influence that is not outwardly discernible? What if for years, pure evil, demons, unclean spirits, Fallen angels, they're all the same thing, mm -hmm. are projecting into you thoughts, feelings, moods, and attitudes. What if most Ouija and EVP sessions do work, but they work silently? 
You see, the long walk in the wrong spiritual direction does more, much more to expand the kingdom of darkness than a short spurt of spiritually dark fireworks, like slamming of a door, yeah. which brings in the cavalry to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay, which brings us full circle. Using a Ouija board may lead to manipulation of a person's hands, but both Ouija boards and EV sessions will 100% of the time result in the breaking of a serious, objective law of God, which brings dishonor to the singular honor and dignity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if Jesus has the keys to life, death, and the grave, then the very notion of ghosts is an implicit denial of this glorious fact. So we're calling for radicals of all ages to confront the evil and the error that is plunging the paranormal community into darkness. Y'all, the time is short, and we really need to make our lives count for the Lord and to reach out for people who are struggling in the darkness and don't even know it. That's true, really, really true. And I remember you mentioned, Mark, um, maybe you might want to share this story about an adventure sorry an episode of ghost adventures where a six-year-old boy was given a digital recorder as a present oh yeah in I'd, order to hunt yes. for ghosts um maybe you could relay that to us and also something you shared about zach baggins sure and what uh, he yeah. experienced i'd be very glad to and um let's see Ghost Adventures is pretty popular, so in a in a, uh, about a year ago, year or two ago, uh, in an episode of Ghost Adventures, two things uh, had stuck out in my, my mind, Laura. First, there they they the crew, the three guys, interviewed a six-year-old boy who had been given a digital recorder as a present <laughs> mm. in order to hunt for ghosts. Oh. Isn't that awful. Six years. A little. Yeah, the little boy, um, uh, this was on camera, he, he pointed to a rock on which he was sitting, and he said that an orb had landed right next to him recently, and then it moved to the other side of him. And then it suddenly shot up in the air, only to drop down and enter his head. Oh. And this graphically illustrates how hugely prevalent spirit solicitation has become. Mm -hmm. And what is particularly disturbing about this story is that this bundle of intelligent energy enters the boy's head. Mm -hmm. And horrendous. Yeah, it is it is really horrendous. And you know it, all the people, the the boy and everyone else were just celebrating it as if it oh. were some Gosh. kind of cool thing you know and the thing is folks don't realize now on this occasion it just so happens the little boy saw this happen to him but you know this is happening to people every time they, they do things like this they don't necessarily see or feel or hear a demon enter them but it does enter them whether they feel it or not um i mean i, I did umpteen different things like 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 that when i was involved in all that stuff I rarely ever felt a demon enter me, but boy did I feel them getting cast out when I eventually became a Christian and they got cast out. Um, right. Yep, so, yeah, it's just such a shame when children are involved in this. Um, please go on to tell us about the show um, regarding Zach Baggins, his experience. Yeah, um, during that same show, Zach Baggins mentions that he had recently been dragged by his feet um, out of his bed and um, on other occasions he had indicated that he was unable to extricate himself from this demonic oppression mm -hmm. and um, him and Aaron uh, had mentioned that it was ruining areas of their lives and it's gotten worse since then because this was like a year or two mm -hmm. and they're they're definitely not alone um, more and more investigators or individuals 
have noticed outward signs of being oppressed or having demonic attachments. And um, so if there's any investigators listening to this, mm -hmm. have you had something follow you home? And I realize that many, if not most, of our readers are not into the investigation, but you're probably into the paranormal in some sense, or you wouldn't be listening to this. Mm -hmm. But it's still important to understand what's happening. And I only mention Zach Bagans, and a lot of people just you know don't like him. Other people are in love with him. Um, but the point is, is that. This indication, him being yanked out of his bed and it messing with his relationships, this is something that, um, like I had mentioned and had a discussion with Dave Schrader, in which I admire his uh, candor, was has become the deep, dark secret of the paranormal community. Uh, I know of one gal, um, I, can't men I cannot mention her name, mm -hmm. um, just wouldn't be proper, but she has spent 40 years helping people, um, but um, she has all kinds of crazy things happening in her house. It will start raining, unnatural rain in one room, namely her bedroom, um, and stop, and she thinks nothing of it. Mm -hmm. She has become so deluded and and so um, misguided in her mind and in her heart that even when the walls seem to start pulsating she'll just laugh and just uh, say it's time for you to leave you know quit messing with us that type of thing her and her husband or her boyfriend forget which it is and you know I, I, I'm gonna say this is that anybody who's listening I, I know how common paranormal activity is. It's extremely common. Mm -hmm. And many people, and this frustrates a lot of folks who, are, who, who do, well, it frustrates Laura and I, the number of people who choose to live with paranormal, paranormal activity, either because they think it's cool, they don't know what to do, they're confused, they can't get help from their priest or the pastor or whatever. And I can say this with certainty, is that all paranormal activity is demonic activity because holy angels are not going to do mischievous things. They're not going to walk um, around on make sounds in the ceiling. They're not going to move your car keys. They're not going to scratch you. They're not going to make scratches on the walls that type thing. They are our servants. Mm -hmm. And so I can say this, and I know some people will laugh at it, but as a general rule, knowing that angels are real, and there's more of them, and God has defeated the demons, but nevertheless, Laura, as a general rule, all demonic activity is, excuse me, all paranormal activity is demonic activity. You need to get that in your head. There's nothing cool about it. Um, it. It may be sensational, but it's sensational pure evil mm -hmm. is what it is. And we have to realize this, too, that just because something is supernatural doesn't mean it's from God. All that glitters is not gold in the paranormal realm. Mm -hmm. And just as there's supernatural good, there's supernatural evil. Um, but many folks have not learned to to discern between supernatural evil and supernatural good. And the demonic and Satan are very adept at trying to portray themselves as, as, as holy, as loving, merciful, and so forth. You know, we're told that Satan can appear as an angel of light, mm -hmm. which is the exact opposite of what the Prince of Darkness is. So it would be a snap for one of his um, uh, followers to, you know, look like uh, Uncle Joe or Aunt, uh, you know, Aunt Frances, mm -hmm. uh, or as a little child. Uh, it just blows my mind the number of people who still think that God would let children be stuck here. It's, 
I think that's the main issue, Laura, is how, what's your view of God? You know, is he God or is he not? Is he the sovereign creator of heaven and earth mm -hmm. and owns our souls, our bodies and our souls? Is he holy, and omnipotent, all wise, just, um, or is he just this little godlet who, when we die, our souls are just like free agents that float around here and there. Mm -hmm. uh, people get all weirded out if somebody dies in a home and that's going to be, you know, a great uh, recipe for a haunting. Well, friends, folks have been dying in their homes since the dawn of time. Mm -hmm. It's not that big a deal. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And God is is, is, is is powerful, you know, but what, he knows before someone dies when they're about to die. He knows the second they've died, you know, he's yep. not going to lose he's someone. And, you know, you hear about people saying, go into the light and all of this. You know, is, is God going to suddenly just lose a soul because it's just died? No, it, you know, as you say, we, we all go to God and, and face God and, and the judgment. He can't just lose someone that become an earthbound trapped spirit it's just not possible for god to to lose a soul um to, to you know its destination that that doesn't make any sense neither can you run away from heaven or run away from hell when god is is the one who's no in you know that control. notion it it speaks a lot about a person's exactly you can't escape uh, your eternal destiny, and, and that's why we are. We're not seeing these things in judgment. We're not against these people, the paranormal investigators, or any of the names we've listed of these people. Not at all. We're just yeah. very concerned for them and, and concerned for their followers. Um, and you know, there was a, a little analogy, Mark, that I saw on Facebook actually that I shared with you. And um, you and I were, were discussing it. I just want to uh, briefly summarise it. Someone has said, you know, what was Eve doing in the beginning before she sinned back in the Garden of Eden? What was she doing? She was talking to a serpent. Standing there listening and, and talking to a serpent. Uh, and the, the writer asked, should we be talking to serpents? <laughs> of course, the serpent being the analogy of, of Satan or, or a demon. Well, the answer is really no, you know, because look what happened. She spoke with the serpent. It made her question God, his words, his motives, um, what the serpent said, played on her emotions, you know, to, to become like God. And it brought to her uh, attention things that would be desirable for her. And then obviously her and Adam ate, ate the, the, the fruit. So, you know, the analogy is, why even right. talk to serpents in the first place? The deception is real. Stay away from conversations with serpents and ask God to speak to you. Speak to the Holy Spirit. Let him guide you in all areas um, of your life. And I thought that was was quite a clever little analogy yeah it really it really is it uh it shows how from the dawn of time up until 2017 uh some things uh, the song remains the same here's a question maybe this is for next time but laura why oh why why do so many christians who's who allegedly know the bible why do they continue to attempt to communicate with the dead when the Bible's so clear. Why? Yeah. Um, well, I think there's a, a few reasons and we'll definitely get into that next yeah. time. But I think one of them being like what we mentioned earlier, because something becomes so acceptable within culture, Yes. people will go along with it. And all through the Bible we saw that happen, that, that people who followed God... Um, very often would at times turn away from him to follow what their neighbours were doing because it was part of the culture. Um, time, of, time of the judges. People did what was right in their own eyes. Yeah, up and, and down, up and down. 
And, and I think as well, because initially they might feel a little warning bell, they might think, oh, maybe I shouldn't do that, maybe that's dangerous, maybe it's sinful. But when we do um, participate in something, anything that is sinful, um, what happens is we, we eventually, that little warning bell becomes dimmer and dimmer, and we, ev yeah. we eventually just ignore those those kind of a warnings the conscience tells us, and we just dive more and more into it, and then we become blind to it, um, and we accept yes. it more and more. And the Bible does say God allows us, he, he allows us to become deceived, he allows us to get into error yeah. um, if we choose to do so. Um, so yeah, and I think that's one of the reasons why, that's why, great. It, why it can happen. Yes. Um, Thank you. And then the person, yeah, they, they, they've been doing it for so long, they just accept it, they fail to see um, that it is sin or, or that it is mentioned in the Bible. Um, and I, th I think in addition to that, uh, sorry if I'm interrupting, because you, you, you explained that so well, thank you. Uh, I think in addition to that, something I mentioned earlier was just the influence of well-known people who do it? Um, you know, you can name names of, of uh, TV celebrities and people who have written a bunch of books and so on, and a lot of people. Or, or, or you, or you can take um, um, priests, exorcists, God, who God has used to, in a powerful way, to free people from horrendous possessions. Nevertheless, um, I know of, of uh, you know more than one of these very well-known exorcists who believe in ghosts, mm -hmm. and so hence people who really admire, for example, Malachi Morton, um, whom and, and I do. I read his book, um, the uh, Bondage Breaker, or whatever it is. Um, Bondage, I forget. I can't. But you know, if if and I correct again, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty pretty sure that um, in that uh, in his circles that uh, that there was a belief in um, trap spirits as well. But if it, it wasn't him, I know that, that other exorcists and and other people in the deliverance community, mm -hmm. you know. Um, or make a distinction between a demonic infestation and and um, a ghostly haunt, mm -hmm. and that's pretty common. And yeah. some of the people that are in the groups I'm in, who are very vibrant Christians, and read their Bible all the time, and their godliness, you know, is a real inspiration to me. But they they still still engage in solicitation of, of, of EVPs and mm -hmm. it just baffles and saddens me that mm -hmm. it's so common amongst uh, believers and professing believers. Yeah and I think um, also for some who for some who, who do it and they maybe are aware that it's sin or they maybe are aware that um, you know God's forbidden it but, but they're into it anyway because they believe in ghosts. I think perhaps it's like, well, um, God will forgive me. He's a God of grace and mercy. I know it's wrong, but you know, sometimes I have bad thoughts in other areas of my life. Sometimes I sin with A, B, C, D, and I know he forgives me, therefore he'll forgive me with this. And I think, yes, God does have grace, but, but also we know that um, God's grace, it's there to, to teach us and it's there to our lifetime of, of sanctification. It does take a lifetime um, for us to, you know, keep on purging ourselves of, of certain things. And but, yeah. but God even says in his word, there's places where he said, for example, about Jezebel, you know, I gave her time to repent. So during that space of time when God's grace is on you, even though you're doing these things, it's because he's gently trying to draw you away from it. But some people yeah. will, will even testify and say, you know, I got to the point where I knew God was saying right now enough is enough. I keep showing you this. I keep telling you this. Come out of, of that sin. Um, come out of her, my people as it were, 
um, and the person then thinks, yeah, this it, it's time to, to stop this. So there is, there does, I think, for some people, become a line where they know, I know God is speaking to me now and, and, and it, this is enough. Mm. For others, I think it doesn't happen that way. Um, but yeah, we'll certainly talk more about um, all of us next time. Mark, we just have less than a minute to go. Could you please pray for our listeners? I'd, I'd be delighted to. And, and thank you again thank uh, to you. you and to, you're welcome and to everyone who has, who has listened. Heavenly Father, we bow before you and praise you and um, thank you that in your kindness and in, in your love, you've given us your inscripturated word, the, um, your written word, which reveals to us and brings us into fellowship with your incarnate word, the Lord Jesus. What a gift it is to, to have the Bible, your word written, and for us to be able to have your laws, your testimonies, um, your commandments, not to squash us, but to help us become more human and to learn how to please you. And so we do thank you for the laws that you have given us, your Bible, um, and how much it expresses your infinite steadfast love for us. And I, I pray, Lord and I both pray, that you would water every seed that was sown through this interview. Yes, Lord. And that you would protect those seeds from the demonic birds, and that you would fertilize and water these seeds, and that for your glory, that this would have maximum impact on the people who hear it. And, Father, we do love you and the people who are, are struggling. Um, pour out your Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Mark. And, and listeners, please tune in again next time when Mark will share with us some more of this topic in part four of this series. Thank you so much and God bless you. The views expressed in this production may not necessarily be those of Eternal Radio. Eternal Radio. Music for your life with Eternal Radio. End Time Hour is broadcast only on Eternal Radio, along with a host of other unique and excellent programs. Now Eternal Radio is even easier to listen to. You can do this by simply visiting eternalradio.org.uk. That's eternalradio.org.uk and clicking on the Listen Now link. Alternatively, you can listen in on your phone by downloading the TuneIn app or Eternal Radio's very own dedicated apps for both Android and iPhone. It's also possible to tune in on a variety of other platforms including Amazon's Fire TV. Also, if you have any questions for me or for other Eternal Radio hosts, please email us at onairnow at eternalradio.org.uk. That's onairnow at eternalradio.org.uk.